the video you're about to watch is very, 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 very long. <laughs> so I've decided to summarize it for you. Obviously, if you want to delve deeper, to learn the hows and whys and where does it all lead, you will have to dedicate the next hour and a half of your lives to me, Sam Vaknin. But the very fact of creating this summary is proof positive that I'm empathic, caring, loving, and compassionate beyond words. <laughs> and I dare you to argue with this. <laughs> okay, here's a summary. Number one, internal objects or introjects are not simple one-dimensional entities. They are amalgams or collages of representations of an external object, another person, an external object is another person, affects and emotions which go with this other person, memories of that other person, elements of the relationship with that other person, and cognitions or thoughts attendant upon the other person and the relationship with him. So these are hyper, hyper complex networks. Now, creating internal objects is a primitive way to reduce anxiety, anxiolytic. Infants do this. They create internal objects of mummy in order to reduce the abandonment anxiety because they're afraid that mummy will abandon them. The narcissist replicates this. He regresses you to infancy. He creates anxiety and he knows that this will trigger in you the need to create an internal object of the narcissist, to introject. So he triggers introjection in his victims. He forces them by creating an environment which is filled with anxiety and terror and the unexpected, a kind of twilight zone. He forces them to introject him, to create an internal object which represents him in the victim's minds. Next, early childhood introjects are confused with the authentic self. In other words, early childhood introjects, the voices in your head which represent early childhood internal objects are often confused. You think they are your voices. You think they are part of your authentic self. Later life introjects are not confused. You know that these voices don't belong to you. They belong to others. Next, most introjects are aggressive and sadistic. The narcissist introject in your mind, the, narcissist, the internal object in your mind that represents a narcissist, is no exception. Introjects are not the small people in your television set. You remember as kids, small television, as small people in the television set? They are not. Introjects go through a process of photoshopping. They are being idealized. They are being devalued. They are being reshaped and remolded in your mind together with memories, cognitions, effects, and numerous other, other psychological processes. Next, the voices in your head are not merely recordings of the originals replayed. In other words, it's not that you record an external object, record a person, record a narcissist, and then replay it in your mind. That's not an introject. That's not an internal object. It's uh, also not true. Next, introjects are created instantly. That's why I call introjects snapshots in the process, snapshotting. Introjects are not the function. They are not a function of the length of exposure to the original external objects. In other words, it's not true that the longer you're exposed, the, the more time you spend with someone, the more likely you are to create an introject. Introjects are created instantly. They, you create introjects of people who are perceived as significant or fulfill some function in your life. For example, the infant creates an immediate introject of the mother. The narcissist creates instant introjects of people he meets and believes could serve as sources of supply or intimate partners in a shared fantasy. Next, we are born with the capacity to introject, but we are born with no introjects. Introjects are derivatives and emanate from external objects. 
other people. Finally, empathy, empathy is a form of introjection identification. We create an internal object of the person we empathize with, the empathy, and we interact with this internal object. But empathy is instinctual, and therefore it is a threat to the ego, and it fragments it, it splits it off, at least according to the work of Fairburn. Have fun. By now, most of you know that the narcissist installs in your mind a voice, the same way we install apps on our smartphones. The narcissist voice remains with you long after the narcissist is gone physically, has exited your life mercifully. <laughs> His voice is still there, still talking to you, still berating and criticizing you, still undermining your self-esteem, self-confidence and sense of self-worth, still regulating you for better or for worse, still overwhelming you and still making you doubt yourself and your reality testing. This is the voice of the narcissist and it collaborates with other voices in your mind, voices with a similar message, so that a coalition of voices, a constellation of voices is formed and these voices intend basically to take you down. They are self-defeating and self-destructive as far as you are concerned. This whole process is known as introjection. And the narcissist's voice is an introject. But there are many, many misconceptions about introjects, about internal objects. And today I'm going to disambiguate and clarify and edu educate self-styled experts and wannabe scholars online <laughs> who keep getting it wrong. And the second part of the video will deal with the academic background for everything I'm saying. So as usual, like everything Jewish, the video is divided in two parts for laymen and for and more a more advanced part. It's up to you whether you watch the whole thing, which proves that you're a masochist, or whether you watch only the first half which uh, <laughs> I won't say what it proves about you. <laughs> okay, Shoshanim, and who am I to educate everyone around me? My name is Sam Vaknin. I'm the author of the first book about narcissistic abuse, written in the 1990s, Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. I'm a professor of clinical psychology and a professor of business management in CIAPS, Commonwealth Institute of Advanced Professional Studies, Cambridge and Birmingham, United Kingdom, Ontario, Canada, and Outreach Campus in Lagos, Nigeria. And I served for five years as visiting professor of psychology in Southern Federal University in the Russian Federation that ended with the war in Ukraine, <laughs> I regret to say. Okay, let's delve right in and start with a basic definition of an introject. An introject is an amalgam. It's a collage. Collage. It's a compendium. It's a, it's a quilt, if you wish, of representations. Representations in your mind of external objects. Now, in some schools of psychology, the word object denotes a human being. So we don't say humans. We don't say people. We say objects. External object another person, the other, someone else, representations of these people, people out there in your mind, when they are connected to your emotions, your effects, your memories, your cognitions, when there is this alloy, amalgam of the memories of that person, uh, the image of that person, emotions connected to interactions with that person, cognitions, thoughts that you have, ha have had about this person and the relationship with that person. And so when you put all this together, you get an introject. So an introject is not only a voice. An introject is most definitely not an image. An introject 
is a representation of the world, an internal working model, a model of the world, like a theory, like a theory in physics about the world, where there is an external object, a person of interest, a significant other, someone else, intimate partner, mother, father, another person, there's you, a representation of the self, there's a relationship between you, it's a process known as identification, there are memories, cognitions, emotions, affects, you name it. It's a very complex web and network, not a single point, not a point-like structure or point-like entity. Okay, now, let us dispel and debunk a few myths. Early childhood introjects, introjects which you have acquired in early childhood, representations of people in your life, in your early childhood, most notably mother, father, perhaps a few teachers, role models, and influential peers. Anything you have acquired, any introject you have created to represent these people in your mind, before the age of 36 months, before the age of three years old, is often confused with the authentic self. In other words, you're going to mislabel these voices as yours. You're going to think, this voice is me. This voice is who I am. This voice represents what I believe in. This, vo this voice encapsulates my values. This voice is indistinguishable from myself. And so this must be my voice. There's, a, there's an attribution error, misattribution actually. There's a, a problem in distinguishing the externality and separateness of the introject. The fact that it's connected to some entity out there, someone out there. And this is of course because up to age 36 months, the child is essentially a narcissist. Primary narcissism, healthy narcissism. Narcissists are incapable of distinguishing external objects from internal objects. They're incapable of saying people out there and me. There's a boundary between me and the world. Narcissists are incapable of saying this. They're incapable of perceiving it or even conceiving of it. So the child assimilates these voices of significant others, important figures in, in his or her life. They assimilate these voices. These voices become introjects, they become interlinked with emotions, with memories, with effects, with cognitions, and so on. They represent the external object, but because the child is essentially a narcissist, the child is unable to tell the difference between external object and internal object. The introject becomes the external object. So the child says, this introject, this voice in my head, this representation in my mind, this is me. This is me. And so early childhood introjects are indistinguishable from the self. Later life introjects are already perceived as alien, as coming from the outside, as foreign bodies. So when you acquire a later life introject from the narcissist in your life, you know to identify the voice, at least in principle. You're able to say, this voice, this sentence, this message, this signal are not mine. They're coming from the narcissist in my life. They're coming from my ex. They're coming from my former friend. They are, coming, they are not mine. There is no ownership of late life introjects, but there is full identification and full assimilation in a process known as incorporation. There's a full incorporation of early childhood introjects, which then become an integral part of the self. Next thing, most introjects, most of these voices <clears throat> are actually aggressive, harshly critical. One could even say sadistic. Not all of them, but the vast majority of them. Why is that? You will have to listen to the second part of the lecture, where I explain and expound on the theories in psychoanalysis and object relation schools that gave rise to the concept of introject and introjection, and another concept called imago.
So then you will understand why these voices are actually aggressive and sadistic. Next, you remember when you were kids, you thought, you believed fully that there are small people, tiny people inside the television. <laughs> Many self-styled and wannabe experts perceive introjects the very same way, as if we internalize people from the outside, we take them in, and they become trapped in our mind, in our minds, the same way tiny people are trapped in the television set. But that's, of course, nonsense. Because when we introject people, as I said, they get the introject, the representation, <clears throat> becomes intimately and immediately connected to multiple other psychological processes, such as emotions and cognitions and memories and so on and so forth. And it undergoes a transformation. It's either idealized or devalued, or uh, it acquires a specific status, a role in the theater play of the mind. So I call this photoshopping. The introject is photoshopped. Now the voices in your head are not merely recordings of the originals replayed. It's not that you record the original person. It's not that you have recorded the narcissist. And then the voice in your head is a replay of the recording. <laughs> That's not how introjects work. Introjects are actually autonomous. They're able to come up with new content, new types of interactions, new messages, new signals, new texts. Uh, introjects verbalize. So introjects are not merely tape recordings replayed as some schools in psychology suggest, such as Gestalt, but they are much more complex than this. Now, one, um, I've had a moment of comic relief. Um, one of the most common mistakes is to say that the more you're exposed to someone, the more of an introject you have. <laughs> That's funny. Introjects are not like savings account. <laughs> They're not dependent on time and deposits. Introjects are binary. Either you have them or you don't. And introjects are created instantly. The minute you meet someone. The minute you meet someone who is essentially significant to you meaningful to you or the minute you decide that this person this external object is going to play a major role in my life that minute an introject is created and it has nothing to do with the amount of time you spend with this person with how long you've listened to this person with how long this person have been talking to you nothing to do with any of this it's a process of snapshotting Fuck. instant i repeat introjects are created instantly and they are not a function of the length or duration of exposure to the original. Introjects are a function. Introjects are created owing to the significance and the roles and the functions of the originals. <clears throat> Two examples, of course, are the infant mother introjection. The infant introjects its mother instantly immediately on first contact within the first few days so again the infant doesn't say let me be exposed to my mother for 25 hours 30 hours two days three days four days and then i will consider whether to make an introject also introject introjection is not a conscious decision it's an unconscious process that is utterly automated and out of your control you can't help making an introject it's just there suddenly Another example, when the narcissist comes across someone who could serve as a source of supply or someone who could be, uh, who could have a role in a shared fantasy or someone who could become an intimate partner, that minute, the narcissist creates an introject of that person. Even if the narcissist has been exposed to this person on a single date, the narcissist would create an introject. It's even faster with borderline, people with borderline personality disorder they introject much faster than narcissists. So, introjection is the automatic derivative and outcome 
of reaching a, the conclusion that someone is significant to you and that someone can play important functions, usually ego functions. We are born with the capacity to interject, but we are not born with interjects. So interjects are not instincts, they are not reflexes, they are not drives, they are not urges. We are born with all these. According to Fairbairn and some other scholars, we, even born, we are even born with an ego, a primitive ego. But we are not born with interjects. We are born with the capacity to interject. We are born with the ability to engage in interjection. We are born with the, the um, skill, if you wish, the talent, if you wish, to convert external objects into internal objects. Everyone has this. But we are born with zero interjects, a blank slate as far as interjects are concerned. Now, interjection is a process of internalizing not an external object. In other words, it's not a real photograph or a real video or a real audio recording of the external object, <laughs> as some um, uh, would-be would -be psychologists claim. It is an internalization of the functions of the external object. That's why whether the external object is significant to you or not, whether the external object fulfills some roles or not, is very crucial. Because you introject, you internalize the functions of the object. And then you create a mental representation of the object, which incorporates mostly the functions of the object and your relationship with the object. What happens is you create a relationship with the internal object that mirrors, mirrors, reflects your relationship with the external object. You're beginning to develop a relationship with the imagined object inside. This process is known as identification. The resulting mental structure is the introject, the <coughs> introjected object or the internal object. You can pick, pick and choose your terminology. So you see someone, this someone becomes significant, fulfills roles and functions in your life. You introject them automatically, unconsciously. It's not something you control. You introject them by creating a mental space where they are represented in terms of the functions they fulfill in your life. And then you have two relationships going concurrently. One real life relationship with the external object and another relationship with the internal object with this mental space that you have created. Introjection is preceded, therefore, by processes such as internalization and so on and so forth. I have videos dedicated to internalization, identification, incorporation, and introjection, secondary identification. They're all related, but non-identical processes. One example of an introject is the superego. A superego is an introjection of parental figures, partly the mother and mostly the father, actually. The superego can be analyzed and has been analyzed and broken down and reduced to component introjects. For example, the bad father, the good father, the internal father, the internal mother, the good mother, the bad mother, etc., etc. All these introjects put together comprise the superego. Superego is the voice of mother and father telling you, this is right, this is wrong, don't behave this way, behave that way. In other words, social injunctions. Process of socialization involves the introjection of mother, father, their functions, and the messages that emanate from these functions. Introjection is considered a defense mechanism as well. So it's a normal developmental unconscious automated process on the one hand. 
And on the other hand, it's a defense mechanism. It diminishes or reduces separation insecurity, abandonment and separation anxiety. If you internalize mother as an infant, as a baby, as a child, if you, when you internalize mother and later internalize father, then you have captive mother and father, captive parental figures inside your mind. And while real mother and real father may abandon you, the images, the representations, the introjects of mother and father inside your mind will never abandon you because they are you. They're part of your mind. And this reduces the anxiety attendant upon separation and abandonment. Introjection is a developmental process because it increases, enhances autonomy, personal autonomy. When you introject people, you are less dependent on object constancy. When you have a representation of someone in your mind, you are not dependent on the physical presence of that person. That person can travel, can go to work, can leave you and abandon you and divorce you, can dump you and break up with you. Still, you have a re representation of that person, an introject of that person in your mind. And in this sense, you are independent of that person. Introjects enhance agency, personal autonomy, and ultimately self-efficacy. They are very conducive to the regulation of a sense of self-worth and self-esteem and self-confidence. So an introject is a hyper-complex product, the end product of the process of introjection. It's an organized cluster of memory traces, and it includes a self-representation, a representation of oneself within the introject. So the introject has a part that represents the external object and a part that represents you and a part that represents the relationship between you and the internal object that represents the external object. It's an object representation and it has an affective tone. It is this, every, specific, every introject is associated with a specific emotion, a specific effect, and usually a set of specific cognitions, something that is recognized in cognitive behavior therapy. Introjects are not um, to be confused with self-image or self-perception. Identifications can be, but we'll leave it aside. Introjects are not what makes you feel um, confident. In, uh, introjects are not, don't form the way you perceive yourself and so on. Even though there is a representation of yourself within the introject, it's only in the context of the relationship with the external object and with the internal object. Introjects do not affect, usually, self-perception and self-image. But introjects can affect a sense of self-worth, self-esteem, and self-confidence. And again, many wannabe experts and would-be experts and self-styled experts confuse self-esteem, self-confidence, and self-worth with self-image and self-perception. These are not the same terms. These are not the same processes. And these are not the same constructs. We'll come to it maybe in some other video. Most late life introjects are experienced, as I said, as foreign bodies in the psyche. And so very often we try to reject these introjects because they are perceived again as intrusions. They are intrusive in nature. And I'm talking only about introjects created in adult life, later in life. Remember that early childhood introjects are perceived as egosyntonic and they are perceived as authentic. Early childhood objects, uh, introjects are perceived to be you, part of who you are, an integral element of yourself, while late life introjects are perceived as invasions or intrusions. And we try to get rid of them by externalizing them. There are various methods of externalizing. Projection is one of the most well-known 
However, externalizing internal objects rarely works and involves invariably primitive defenses and in more extreme cases, pathologies. We'll come to it a bit later. Now I keep saying representation, representation, representation. I keep saying that integers are representations of external objects in our minds. What am I talking about? Am I talking about a photo, photograph? Am I talking about an audio recording? Am I talking about a video? What, what, what do you mean representation? Is it a thought? Maybe a concept? What is it exactly? In psychology, representation is mental, so it's psychological. And uh, it is symbolic. It's a, a symbol, a symbol for the internal processes provoked by the external object. You remember that I said that external objects have roles, they have functions. External objects create in you internal dynamics. For example, when you fall in love, you fall in love with an external object, but falling in love is an internal dynamic provoked by the external object. So when you take into account all these functions, all these processes triggered in you by the external object, and then you create a symbol, an icon, an avatar for the external object, and you link it to these internal processes, to the emotions provoked by the external object, to the memories you have of the external object, to the effects, to the cognitions connected to the external object. When you've created a library of everything that has to do with this external object, you have a representation. Simple. It's a folder, a folder with all the information about the external object with emphasis on what the external object provokes in you, what the external object does to you, in effect. So it's about you. That's why it's called introject. The introject is not so much about the external object, it's much more to do with your reaction to the external object, conscious or unconscious. So introjection is a process by which an individual unconsciously incorporates aspects of external reality into the self, particularly attitudes, values, emotions, cognitions, qualities of another person, some elements of the personality of another person, as they interact with the self, as they are perceived by the self, as they trigger processes in the, in the self. So it's about the self, not about the external object. When you mourn someone, when you grieve, someone died, a loved one has died, or you've been abandoned or rejected or dumped or broke up with someone. There's a process of mourning, there's a process of grieving, and that's a perfect example of, an, of a, pro, of, or it's, a per, it's a private case of introjection. Mourning and grieving are introjection. What you do, you are creating this time, uh, consciously usually, you're creating a, an emblem you're creating a tombstone, if you wish. You're creating um, um, a kind of a, a kind of uh, place where the mourned or grieved person is kept alive, a mausoleum, where that person is kept alive. But not only the person himself or herself, everything to do with that person, your memories of that person, your emotional reactions to that person, etc., etc. In psychoanalytic theory, introjection is a process of absorbing the qualities of an external object into the psyche in the form of an internal object or mental representation or introject. And this ab absorption, this incorporation, it has an influence on behavior, often unconscious influence. It's a normal part of development. We introject parental values and attitudes in the processes of socialization and acculturation, and we form the superego, as I mentioned before. But as I, it's important to realize that it's also a defense mechanism. 
Introjection is anxiolytic. It reduces anxiety. And this is precisely the interplay between you and the narcissist. The presence of the narcissist, the conduct or misconduct of the narcissist, the intermittent reinforcement, the bullying, all this create heightened anxiety. And one of the most primitive forms of mitigating anxiety, ameliorating and reducing anxiety, is introjection. When we are babies, we introject mummy because we are afraid that mummy would go away. So introjection is linked with a reduction in anxiety. When the narcissist triggers in us anxiety, when it provokes anxiety, we react with introjection. We introject the narcissist. One could even say that the narcissist uses anxiety unconsciously, it's not deliberate, uses anxiety to force us to introject him or her, to force us to create a mental, a powerful mental representation and voice of the narcissist in our minds. I keep saying internal object, internal object. I say, you remember that an external object is another person. Another human being is an external object. But what is an internal object? What is this mental representation that results from introjection, incorporation, internalization? Um, can we deconstruct the internal object? Does it have any visible, visible contours or core or something? How can we grasp it? Um, you could think of an internal object as a set of mirrors. One mirror reflects you. The other mirror reflects the external object and there's a third mirror that reflects both mirror number one and mirror number two and that is the relationship mirror there is a self-representation of the representative agency engaged in the relationship and so this gives rise to complex internal relationships which are then translated into object relationships this is the internal object. It's a metaphor, of course. There are no mirrors inside anyone, but I hope you get the gist of it. It's very difficult to capture the essence of the internal object because it's so instinctive, instinctual, and so intuitive and so unconscious. We all do this uh, starting with the first few days of life. Internal object is an image or representation of a person, particularly someone significant to the individual, such as a parent, that is experienced as an internalized presence within the mind, as if the mind is possessed or occupied somehow. Melanie Klein, one of the mothers of object relations theory, she regarded the psyche as made up of internal objects, actually. And these internal objects have relationships or relations with each other. And she said that this network of internal objects is what we call personality. And when some of these objects are disrupted, they become part objects, or the relationship between them is bad, involves, the relationship involves primitive defenses such as splitting or projection. When something goes awry, then we have symptoms. In her work, in Melanie Klein's work, Everything is a derivative of and emanates from internal objects and the relationships between them. Melanie Klein's work is very literary. It's not scientific like Freud's, let's say. It's, she attributes literal reality to unconscious fantasies, PH, fantasies. She says that inside us, there are agencies or capacities to feel, to think, and to perceive, but she failed to define them or to delineate them clearly. And so it was left to someone called Fairbairn. Fairbairn, F-A-I-R-B-A-I-R-N. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was left to him to try to clarify Melanie Klein's work. He suggested that the internal object 
is a split off part of the ego. He said, whenever we create an internal object, we split off a sliver or a fraction of the ego. And this fraction of ego, this split off ego, remains in a relation with an object that is partially, at least, a dynamic structure. Again, Fairburn failed to define the, the dynamic involved, the dynamism of this structure. He, but it was a step forward. How would we explain the formation of internal objects? Where is the space for them? They take space. Where is this space taken from? It reminds me of the Kabbalah, where God had to minimize himself in order to make space for creation. The same here. The ego minimizes itself. The ego fragments and splits itself in order to let in the light of the internal object. Internal object which represents the relationship with the external object and the functions of the external object. The ego becomes invested in the internal object, but this process actually changes the ego, slices off, splits off a part of the ego, and then there is a dynamic relationship between the internal object and the ego, and Fairbairn failed to specify this dynamism or dynamic relationship. Beyond, Beyond suggested the notion of the bizarre object. He assumed that there is a process in which a sub-organization of the ego, the consequence of the split described by Fairburn, presents itself to itself as a thing. So when the ego splits off, the remaining ego, the bulk of the ego that remains behind after the split, perceives the splinter or the sliver or the split of ego as alien, as a thing as an entity, as the other. It's a fascinating concept. Um, and it's very threatening. When the ego breaks down, when the ego splits, now there's a big part of the ego and a tiny part of the ego, and the big ego perceives the small ego. The small ego became the internal object. The big ego perceives the internal object as alien, as bizarre is a thing. There is estrangement between the big ego and the erstwhile ego that became the internal object. And to solve this, we have the defense mechanism of fantasy. Uh, the ego, the, the, the part of the ego that is perceived as a thing develops a fantasy together with the ego, of being included in part of the object. So, Beyond's work is fascinating because it is a key to understanding many dynamics in narcissism. Um, the split of ego and the big ego perceive the split of ego as a thing, alien in effect, what Beyond called a bizarre object. So they develop a fantasy. In Beyond's work, the split of ego develops a fantasy of being included in the, in the object. But in reality, both parts develop the fantasy. It's a shared fantasy. This is, this is, these are the rudiments of the shared fantasy. When the narcissist comes across an external object, you, an intimate partner, a good friend, the narcissist immediately creates an internal object that represents you in his mind. But this internal object, according to Beyond, used to be a part of the ego, of the narcissist, of the, of the narcissist's ego or self. In my work, the narcissist does not have an ego and does not have a self. Now I'm talking about Beyond's work. Okay, so in Beyond's work, this internal object that represents the external object in the narcissist's mind 
would be perceived as alien, as bizarre, split off from the ego. And the narcissist would be terrified because it's like breaking down, like disintegrating. And so what the narcissist do, does, he creates a fantasy. And in the fantasy, he reincorporates the parts. The fantasy is a fantasy of inclusion in a part of the object. So that now everything is intermeshed. Everything has been reconstructed and reestablished via the agency of the defense mechanism of fantasy. In the narcissist's fantasy, he is unitary. In the narcissist's fantasy, the narcissist perceives himself or herself as a single entity. There's no break. There's no schism. But of course, the fantasy is not reality. In reality, every time the narcissist internalizes an external object, every time the narcissist introjects, there is another fragmentation, another fault line, another break, according to Beyond's work. Now, in my work, the narcissist doesn't have an ego and doesn't have a self, but the narcissist has self-states. So whenever the narcissist internalizes an external object, whenever the narcissist creates an introject that represents you, the external object in his mind, it is closely, immediately closely associated with a specific self-state. The fragmentation is there but it's a fragmentation of self-states rather than a unitary self. It's more kaleidoscopic. And then you become associated with a specific self-state, with specific emotions, specific cognitions, specific memories, a specific process of idealization, devaluation, a specific uh, relationship with a maternal figure. Narcissist converts you to a maternal figure. And of course, a specific need to individuate via separation. The self-state wants to become an individual. And this happens to the narcissist times, time and again. Every time the narcissist engenders a shared fantasy, it happens again. Narcissists are therefore extremely broken and shattered to smithereens internally. In 1963, Fairburn um, took into account especially Melanie Klein's work, but he was, he was later made aware of Beyond's work. Fairbairn, exactly like Klein, by the way, conceived of the ego as present at birth and capable of complete and immediate object relations. This is the perception of Fairbairn and Klein. But Fairbairn said, if the relationship with the primary object primary object is mother. If the relationship with the primary object fails, the ego is incapable of coping with this failure. It's very threatening failure because if you are two years old, if you're one year old, if you're six months old and you fail in your relationship with mommy, you're in bad shape. You're likely to die. Mommy won't care for you. Mommy won't feed you. Mommy won't give you shelter and you will die because you're helpless and you're dependent to the maximum. So when there's a failure of primary object relationship, the ego, which exists at birth, according to Klein and Ferber, the ego is terrified. And what it does as a defense against this terror, against this horror movie of having failed with mommy, what the ego does, it splits off aspects of the self. It says, the ego kind of says, mommy doesn't like this and mommy doesn't like that. And that's why my relationship with mommy is defunct and is a failure. If I were to only change myself, mommy would love me. So the ego splits off aspects of the self that appear undesirable to the mother. And there is a fixation to an unsatisfactory aspect of the object. This relation as a whole is repressed because it cannot come to consciousness. 
if the infant were to consciously experience this, the infant would mentally die, would become essentially the equivalent of psychotic. So all this is repressed. All this is underground, subterranean. The dual aim of mastering emotions and creating the desired change in oneself and in the object, by changing oneself, oneself one changes mother. All this process is unconscious. According to Fairburn, dynamic ego structures possess a certain autonomy in relation to the personality and personality is considered as unique. But they also have relationships with internal objects as representative of external objects. So all these scholars, Melanie Klein, Fairburn, Gantry later, Winnicott, as we shall see, all of them were trying to grapple with the fact that when we interact with other people, we actually don't interact with them directly, but we interact with the way we see them. We interact with other people with, through the, via the agency of how we perceive them. Similarly, we don't interact with the physical world. We interact with our brain's interpretation of the physical world. We interact with sensor, with sensory inputs which are not necessarily authentic and loyal and faithful to the external world. When we come across external objects, when we come across other people, and these other people become significant and meaningful and functional in our lives, we are so terrified of losing them, usually, that we create an internal representation. And we hold on to this inter internal representation for dear life. The internal object becomes the anchor we hold on to the internal object for dear life because the external object can walk away at any time or die or something. The internal object is there forever. We invest emotionally, we affect the internal object, not the external object. And in this sense, we're all, to a large extent, narcissists, or at least narcissistic. And that was the view of all the major scholars until late in, in the 1970s. According to Fairburn, the concept of the undifferentiated id is replaced by the idea of unconscious ego object structures. So, um, Fairburn rejected, in effect, Freud's tripartite model. He said it's all about relationships. Fairburn and and other scholars of the object relations school, especially in the United Kingdom, they said it's all about relationships. It's not about what happens here. It's what about, about what happens there. It's our reaction to the world. It's our interaction with others that ultimately these interactions coalesce and become who we are. It's a relational approach to the constellation, integration and formation of the self and the ego. In 1954, Donald Winnicott, a pediatrician turned psychoanalyst, proposed the notion of the false self. <clears throat> now, the false self is often confused with the ego ideal. It's not. Nothing to do with each other. <laughs> the false self is a defense organization, not even a mechanism. It's a whole structure. It's a whole construct. It's a whole personality organization. So it's what used to be called the as-if personality. So the false self is a defense organization developed to counter the threat of annihilation and negation and vitiation. It's a form of self-soothing. The false self is a form of self-soothing and self-care. It's a manifestation of self-love, an attempt at self-preservation and survival. The false self is imbued with energy, affected, and it manages life in order to shield the individual and the false self from the experience of intense pressure to develop according to the internal logic of someone else. So the false self says, I'm going to develop my own way. I'm not going to react to undue influence, to the breaching of boundaries, to the refusal to separate of my mother or later my father. I'm going to be my own man, 
I'm going to be my own woman. I'm going to be a big girl. I'm going to be a big boy. That's the false self, big, godlike. Wilfred Bion, in 1962, came up with the concept of the container. The container is a process that goes from projective identification to reintrojection. Beyond this cast, the unconscious fantasy of projecting into someone else the undesirable or damaged part or rejected parts of the self. And later, this can be reintrojected after modification by the container. It's a brilliant concept. Beyond was brilliant, by the way. Much, much neglected figure in psychology. He says we project to someone, that someone modifies the projection, and then we reintroject it. We take back. We give someone, we attribute to someone a part of ourselves which we are not happy with, which we reject. That someone changes the, the part that we attributed or that we projected to him, and then we reintroject it, we reintroduce it. Projective identification, according to Beyond, is a personality split and an, an ejection of the split of part as an internal object. The bizarre object in Beyond's work is an internal object, experienced by the patient as having a life of its own. It's an ego split. Um, the patient at the same time recognizes the self as a thing enclosed in the object. Now, this is very common in psychotic disorders, in schizophrenia, and consequently in borderline personality disorder and in narcissism. Kernberg was the first to suggest or among the first to suggest that the distinction between psychosis and neurosis is not that clear cut. That personality organizations such as borderline and narcissism are one and the same in many ways, or that borderline is a defense against narcissism, but they are all members of the pseudo psychotic family, almost psychotic. That's why they are called borderline disorder, on the border of psychosis. There was a psychologist, Thomas Ogden, Thomas Ogden, O-G-D-E-N. He said that the internal object relationship implies an interaction between two divisions of the personality. Each of these divisions, said Ogden, is an active agency. So Ogden was one of the precursors of the self-state theories of personality, later propounded on by Bromberg and others. Ogden suggested to conceive of the internal object as an aspect of the split ego, projected into and identified with an object representation. So, we, we see that internal, the issue of internal object bothered scholars throughout the, throughout the ages. Um, is an internal object a breakdown of the ego somehow? Uh, is the internal object connected to the manufacturing of meaning? These sub-organizations or sub-personalities or self-states, self do they correspond to the representation of objects? Is everything internal objects? Is there nothing except internal objects? There were many debates. There were many debates and they were not resolved. There was a psychologist, Maria Torok. She wrote uh, The Illness of Mourning and the Fantasy of the Exquisite Corpse. <laughs> yes. It was published in 1968 with a revision in 1994. She said that what is interjected is not the object, but the ensemble of drives and their vicissitudes for which the object serves as an occasion or a mediator. The goal here is to subjectify to introduce into the ego unconscious, anonymous, or repressed drives, such as the libido. So Torok, T-O-R-O-K, Torok distinguished the internal object from the imago. The internal object represents one pole in introjection. The imago represents everything that the ego appropriates through fantasies or through incorporation, bringing together everything that had resisted interjection. An imago of fixation, 
So in Togok's work, the imago is a failed introjective relationship with an external object. It acts to prohibit drives, to inhibit them. Beyond the object, desire is lost, buried in what she called an endocryptic identification. We're going to discuss the imago momentarily and make a distinction between the imago and the internal object, a distinction lost on many, many wannabe scholars and even real scholars. But before we go there, we've been discussing ego, we've been discussing internal objects, introjects, and so on and so forth, as if these were hand luggage, something you buy, a smartphone, a television set, a refrigerator. No. It's not, there's, it's not that there's you and there's your ego. There's you and there's yourself. There's you and there's your internal objects. These are not add-ons. These are not plugins. The internal objects are who you are. This is known as ego identity. Ego identity is the experience of the self as a recognizable persistent entity resulting from the integration of all the above mentioned internal objects, the ego ideal, roles in life, ways of adjusting to reality, cognitions, emotions, affect, and so on. There's a gradual acquisition of a sense of continuity and contiguity, and it is the foundation of identity. Sense of continuity critically depends on memories, Memories critically depend on internal objects. Internal objects critically depend on external objects. When you have memories, you have an identity. When you have an identity, you have a sense of self-worth. The kind of integration that Eric Erikson believed to be the essential process in personality development. And I encourage you to watch a video I've made about Erikson's eight stages of psychosocial development. In psychoanalytic theory, the ego ideal is the part of the ego that is the repository of positive identifications with parental goals, parental values and beliefs. The individual genuinely admires, wishes to emulate and imitate um, the parents, mother and father. And when the individual comes across, for example, honesty, mother is honest father is loyal, they both have integrity, they serve as a model, they can serve as a role model for good, they can serve as a role model for bad, for evil, but the child is impervious, the child imitates, the child emulates, and the child imitates and emulates via the process of identification and introjection. The child creates internal objects that represents mommy and daddy. And these internal objects are imbued with the behaviors and traits and values and beliefs of mommy and daddy. So if mommy and daddy are criminals, the child is likely, up to a certain stage in life, is likely to adopt these values and beliefs and methods of misconduct. As new identifications are incorporated in later life, the ego ideal develops and changes, luckily for us. Sigmund Freud incorporated the ego ideal into the concept of the superego, but that's probably a mistake because when the ego ideal is breached, we experience shame, the shame of not living up to our internal standards and expectations. When the superego is breached, we experience guilt, the guilt of having acted wrongly, unethically, and immorally. The superego, in psychoanalytic theory, is the moral component of the personality that represents parental and societal standards. The superego determines personal standards of right and wrong. So it's just another word for conscience. But the superego is also the seat, according to Freud's work, of aims and aspirations. In other words, it incorporates the ego ideal. And of course, the superego is part, part of the ego. 
So it's the ego. The ego is an ego ideal part, a super ego part, and so on and so forth. And in Freud's work, at least initially and mistakenly in my view, he identified, he conflated ego ideal with super ego. So the ego imposes rules, a uh, super ego imposes rules and principles. And they stem from parental expectations, demands, prohibitions, and injunctions. The formation of the superego occurs on an unconscious level in the first five years of life. And it continues throughout adulthood, childhood, adolescence, and then adulthood. Through identification with the parents and later with other models of behavior, other role models, which are admired or adulated or held in awe or even feared. So it's an ongoing process. Interjection is an ongoing process. And of course, the superego is an internal object. It's a highly complex internal object. It's a constellated internal object, but it's an internal object because it includes mental representations of external objects, mother and father, and later on in life, other role models. One should not confuse the superego with the primitive superego. Primitive superego is what I call in my work an internalized bed object. In object relations theory, the superego was first used in 1934 by British psychoanalyst James Strachey. It's, the primitive superego is a superego which is very early in life, pre-verbal actually, superego, pre-genital in classic psychoanalytic theory. And this primitive superego is the outcome of the introjection of especially harsh, terrifying, sadistic, rejecting, neglectful, abandoning bad objects. Uh, so when the external objects are emotionally dead, when the external objects are narcissistic, selfish, depressed or depressing, emotionally withdrawn, avoidant, neglectful, rejecting, abandoning, hateful, abusive, traumatizing, when the external objects induce terror, coupled with the dependency of the child on them, the child internalizes the judgments of the external objects in the form of a bad object. So the child internalizes a bad object and that's the primitive superego. A primitive super, superego is an internal bed object that keeps informing the individual throughout life. You're unworthy. You're unlovable. You're a failure. You're inadequate. You're stupid. You're ugly. When the child is faced with a dead mother, a rejecting father, the child has two options. The child can demonize the parental figures. The child can say, I have a bad mother, I have a bad father. But that's terrifying. To admit that your mother is bad or your father is evil is, is life-threatening. So instead of doing this, the child splits the parental figures and adopts the bad object. The child says, I am bad. I am bad. I'm being punished. I'm being ignored, I'm being abandoned, I'm being rejected because I'm bad, because I'm inadequate, because I'm unworthy, because I'm unlovable, because I'm stupid, because I'm evil, because I'm wicked. That's why my parents don't love me, don't care for me. And this is the primitive superego. Now, <clears throat> to the imago. <clears throat> the imago is a huge model because it's been confused even by its own creators it's been confused with the with complexes in jungian theory it's been conflated with other concepts uh, such as archetypes again in jungian theory so it became a huge mess it's been appropriated by object relation schools even by freud and everyone gave it its their own interpretation and today 
It's such a mess that it even misleads scholars. Even scholars are misled and use the concept of imago wrongly, misidentifying it with introjection, introjects, eternal objects, and so on and so forth. Now, an imago is an unconscious prototype of a person. The imago determines the way in which you apprehend others, in which you perceive others. Because the imago is like a template. Imago is like a template. It's like a, a general blueprint on how to relate to other people. When you want to interact with someone, you revert to your imago. You go to the imago and say, how should I interact with human beings? There is this character. There is this beautiful woman. There is this man I want as a friend. There is this, you know, and I want to interact with them. What's your advice? How to do that? And there is an unconscious prototype of human, a human being. And the imago tells you how to perceive that human being. It's Imago is a consequence of very early real and fantasmatic, fantastic, intersubjective relations with family members, most notably, again, mother and later father. So the Imago was first described in, in the work of Carl Jung in 1912, and then it was borrowed by Freud and and Jung himself then changed his mind and he said actually the imago is the complex and then he changed his mind again in the 30s and said no the imago is not the complex and everyone agreed that the imago is somehow linked to repression in neurosis through regression the imago provokes the return of an old relationship or form of relationship the reanimation of parental representations. Um, so it's a unique aspect of the unconscious. It's kind of, the imago is kind of the archaeology of the initial relationships you have had with mother and father, the first ones, first human beings in your life. When I say mother, maternal figure, yes? So these initial relationships, when you were one month old, six months old, two years old, these initial relationships got buried. They became archaeological layers, strata, in some excavation. And the imago is the repository or the trigger to these archaeological layers. In 1933, Jung said, this intrapsychical image, the imago, comes from two sources the influence of the parents on the one hand and the child's specific relations on the other. It is thus an image that only reproduces its model in an extremely conventional way. He situated the imago, as he said, between the unconscious and consciousness, in a sense, as if in Kiyo school. So the imago is autonomous the imago is partially a complex because it's in the unconscious it's, and it's not fully integrated with consciousness. Freud himself used the imago in the Jungian sense in more or less the same year, 1912, a few months before Freud's. And he wrote in the dynamics of transference, if the father imago, to use the apt term introduced by Jung, is the decisive factor in bringing this about, the outcome will tally with the real relationship relations of the subject to his therapist, to his doctor. So he was, these were the rudiments of transference. The imago has been interpreted in a variety of ways, trying to, people were trying to understand, scholars were trying to understand what does it mean to gain access through the imago, to gain access through the imago to the shape, to the form, to the structure, and to the function, and to the content of very, very, very old, the first relationships in one's life? 
initially with mother. What does it mean, mean this axis? Is it, for example, erotic fixation? Is it related to the real traits of primary object? Real observations about mother and father? Or is it totally fantastic? Um, does it have to do with the objects themselves, with mother herself? Or does it have to do more with the relationship itself? Not, not so much with mother, but with the way, way the child interact, had inter interacted with mother, the way, the way the child had felt about mother, the way the child had experienced mother. So which is it? Is the imago, in other words, the encapsulation and capturing of dynamic processes? Or is it static, exactly like a photograph? And if it is static, how can we mine it? How can we access it? It needs to be dynamic in order to interact with our consciousness, or even with our unconscious. There needs to be a dynamic element. Um, the child's links with the parents, they're the most important thing. The way the child subjectively perceives the parents, this is inherent in the, in the modern concept of the Ibago. Freud suggested that some representations, some internal objects, have the status of the Imago, and some don't, and I will not go into all of this. Uh, but in the 1920s, many, many scholars, Shandow Ferenczi, Sigmund Freud, Jung, others, as you will see, many of them reached the conclusion that the imago and more generally internal objects represent aggression, sadism. Most internal objects are, are self-destructive, are threatening, are ominous. They're spliced off and they're split off and they're buried and they're repressed because they contain a nucleus of potential trauma. In the economic problem of masochism, Freud used the term imago in the Jungian sense in relation to moral masochism and the emergence of the superego. Jung did the same. Jung also considered the imago as having something to do with the sadistic injunctions or the injunctions of a sadistic superego in some kind of moral self-flagellation and self-torture, masochism. He wrote that behind the power, Freud wrote, that behind the power exerted by the first objects of the libidinal instincts, in other words, behind the power exerted by the parents, there's the hidden influence of the past, traditions, society, culture, the figure of destiny, the last figure in a series that begins with the parents. And this is all integrated into the agency of the superego, as if the superego was, was something impersonal. But in fact, it's directly connected all the time to internal objects which, objects which represent the parents, possibly parental imagos. Melanie Klein definitely is identified with the concept of the imago. Besides the classic imagos, Klein described what she called a combined parental, combined parental imagos. And she said that combined parental imagos provoke the most terrible states of anxiety. So she also considered internal objects as negative, as aggressive, as self-defeating, as self-destructive. She said that imagos are linked to the stage of the apogee of, of sadism, the apex of sadism. And in 1946, she coined the phrase the schizoid paranoid position to describe the emergence of internal objects in the process of introjection. In Klein's view, the young child develops cruel, aggressive fantasies about the parents. The child then projects these fantasies onto the parents and, believe, and, becomes, and comes to believe that they're cruel, they're sadistic. The child develops a distorted, unreal and dangerous image of people 
the child then introjects this image and it becomes the early superego. Klein described the early superego more as an imago than as an agency or, or even an introject. So, again, we come full circle to the narcissist. The narcissist, when the narcissist creates an introject in your mind, this introject automatically is associated with cruelty, with sadism, with aggression, with criticism, with censorship, with hatred, with negative effects. Susan Isaacs, Isaac, Susan Isaacs, I'm sorry, defined what, it, what she meant by, by imago. She said that an image or imago is what is interjected during the process of interjection. So Susan Isaacs melded, combined, coalesced interjection and interjects with imago. She said it's one of the same. It's a complex phenomenon and it starts with a concrete external object. And then it, this concrete external object is taken, taken into the self. It becomes an internal object. Isaac's seminal book, The Nature and Function of Fantasy, PH, Fantasy with PH, in 1948, and she wrote, in psychoanalytic thought, we have heard more of imago than of image. The distinctions between an imago and image might be summarized as A, Imago refers to an unconscious image. B. Imago usually refers to a person or part of a person, the earliest objects, part objects, whilst image may be of any object or situation, human or otherwise. And C. Imago includes all the somatic and emotional elements in the subject's relation to the imaged person. The bodily links in unconscious fantasy with the id the fantasy of incorporation, which underlies the process of introjection. So according to Isaacs, the introject, as I said, when I started this video, when we were all much, much younger, the introject is not only a representation of the external object, definitely not a photograph, audio recording, or any of or video recording, or any of that nonsense spewed online. The introject, I will read to you again, her definition of the introject, which she conflates with the imago. She says the imago is just another name for an introject, for an internal object. She says it includes all the somatic and emotional elements in the subject's relation to the imaged person, to the external object. The bodily links in unconscious fantasy with the id, the fantasy of incorporation, which underlies the process of introjection. Whereas in the image, the somatic and much of the emotional elements are largely repressed. There's a forgotten article in 1938 titled Les complexes familieux dans les formations de l'individu. The family complexes in the formation of the individual. It was authored by who else? Jacques Lacan. Lacan drew a connection between the imago and the complex in the wake and in the footsteps of Carl Jung. <clears throat> and he advanced at that stage his theory of the imaginary. So Lacan's theory of the imaginary, which deserves a video of its own, has a lot to do with introjection and internal objects. Lacan said that the imago is the constitutive element of the complex. The complex makes it possible to understand the structure of a family institution caught between the cultural dimension that determines it and the imaginary links that organize it. Lacan described three stages. He said there's the winning complex, the intrusion complex in which the mirror stage is described, and the Oedipus complex. And this complex imago stru structure prefigures what would become the topology of the real, imaginary, and symbolic. But again, we'll not go into all this. A very important imago, a very important internal object is known as the idealized parental imago. It's a narcissistic configuration. It arises from the child's attribution of former lost narcissistic perfection to an admired and omnipotent self-object. Um, so the idealized parental imago is when the child transitions from self-idealization, 
um, the belief in narcissistic perfection. And what the child does, he doesn't want to get rid of this narcissism. He doesn't want to get rid of this grandiosity, this sense of perfection. So it imbues it, it imbues the parents, it imbues the internal objects that represent the parents with this perfection. The child creates internal objects that represent mommy and daddy. And then the child says, these internal objects, these self objects, they are perfect. They are godlike. But these are self objects, of course. They're internal, but they're also an integral part of the self. So the idealized parental imago has a lot to do with the ego ideal. It can be the object of fixation, and it is integrated in this in the self in order to lead to ideals and idealistic thinking. But it can remain. And in cases of fixation, in cases of pathology, it does remain a concrete self-object, distinct from the self. This is the case in narcissism, in pathological narcissism, where the parental imagos have not been integrated into the self because there's no self. And they remain inside the narcissist, these internal objects remain inside the narcissist. They are perfect. They're godlike, they're idealized, but they're also harsh. They're also sadistic. They're also aggressive and they're also cruel. The narcissist has to gratify them. The narcissist gratifies them initially by sacrificing the true self. And then later on, the narcissist tries to gratify these internalized parental imagos by performing for them, accomplishing things, and then the narcissist creates fantasies of grandiosity. And finally, in order to placate these internal gods, cruel, unrelenting, callous gods, the narcissist sacrifices you, everyone around him, within a shared fantasy. Heinz Code wrote an article, Forms and Transformations of Narcissism, in 1966, and then incorporated it in, in his book, Analysis of the Self, in 1971. He said that the idealized parental imago accounts for the need to merge with an all-powerful object and for religious and idealistic feelings of varying degrees of intensity. He said that these parental imagos, which are perfect, godlike, idealized, give rise to an idealizing transference in therapy, in analysis. Few years later, in 1977, he wrote a book in, uh, titled The Restoration of the Self. He perceived of imagos or internal objects as a pole of the self, possibilities, potentials of the self. And they acquire, uh, and, the, and the self acquires its cohesion by responses of the self objects that promote a sense of merging and calm what Freud called the oceanic feeling. One pole can compensate for the other. Idealization can compensate for deficient mirror responses, for example. The self will be fragile only if both poles fail the function. In the case of narcissism, of course, this dynamic is huge, is fundamental. Okay. Uh, there's a big debate about Code's work. Is narcissism an independent line of development? Is narcissism natural and just undergoes a cancerous transformation later in life into pathological narcissism, etc.? It's a huge debate. I will not go into all of this. One last comment about empathy. Empathy is not possible without introje introjection. Internal objects are crucial to empathy. The ability to create internal objects, the ability to maintain them, the ability to invest in them emotionally, the ability to interact and have relationships with internal objects, but above all, the ability to tell the difference between internal objects and external objects, the ability to recognize the separateness and externality 
and autonomy and independence of external objects. Roland Barthes says that empathy is a word that is compromised by sociology. He says that it's the consciousness of the social other. Barthes said we should return to a more psychoanalytic sense, empathic coalescence with internal objects. So he borrowed it from uh, Jean Guillaume, Jean Guillaume. The concept of empathy is very close to a concept of unison uh, in the work of these of these thinkers, but they emphasize the role of internal object. Now, historically, as you know, the word empathy, ironically, was coined by a German, and it was used to describe the aesthetic reaction to works of art. It was called Einfühlung, communion, affective communion, or something like that. We, and so empathy is defined as a, a, a specific psychical process. We conceive of someone else's psyche more or less directly as our own experience. We, we appropriate someone else's experience, someone else's being, someone else's existence, someone else's soul. We appropriate it, we internalize it, we introject it, we convert it into an internal object. This is the precondition for empathy. Empathy is just another word for identification, in effect. According, according to uh, Winterstein, or Winterstein, <laughs> depending on the period, in 1931, the process of empathy takes place in such a way that the id, in some way or another, realizes the condition. Realizes the condition of the other. This primitive part of you, the instincts, the drives, resonates with the same primitive part in parts in other people, identifies with other people on the basis of equal emotional preparedness or equivalent instinctual attitudes. So it's closely related to instincts. If we take it a step further, we may say that empathy is instinctual. And because empathy is a private case of identification and introjection, Perhaps we could we could say, we could generalize and say that introjection and identification and incorporation and, and all these are actually instinctual manifestations. Now this would be revolutionary because in Freud's work and everyone that followed Freud, instincts are dangerous. Instincts are repressed, controlled, diverted, channeled by the ego including the superego. So if introjection and internalization are instinct are instinctual in nature, that would imply that they negate the ego. And we are coming back full circle to Fairburn, who said that whenever we create an internal object, we fragment the ego, we split off the ego. It seems that some thinkers are leading to the conclusion that ego functions and ego processes are inimical, they're hostile to introjection and identification. And yet the ego itself, definitely the superego, is the outcome of identification and introjection. This is a conundrum. Is the ego being territorial, like identification, introjection, mission accomplished, end of story, I don't want any any other intrusions into the psyche? It's one possibility. The other possibility is that constant introjection identification is a threat to equilibrium or homeostasis or stability of the personality, reality testing, other ego functions. I don't know. But these are intriguing thoughts. Uh, once the id in Winterstein's work, once the id recognizes another person's id, once the ids resonate, once the primitive parts resonate, equivalent affective impulses are mobilized. In other words, this provokes emotions. Emotions that reflect the emotions in the other person, related dispositions of feeling are experienced and made conscious to the ego as inner perception so that they are converted into the impulses of movement, 
that are inherent in them. So this is the sequence. Initially, we resonate with each other primitively. Then we resonate with each other emotionally. This becomes conscious. The ego takes over, mobilizes us, causes movement or motion. In all this process, the only way to resonate with another person is to generate an internal object that represents that other person in our minds and is experienced as internal. That's why empathy is an internal experience, not an external one. It's not the same as observation, which psychopaths and narcissists are capable of in cold empathy. So, what is foreign to the psyche is by virtue of identification, experienced to a certain extent in empathy as belonging to one's own psyche, especially since the motto innovations in the empathic process are sensed as being very close to the ego, according to Winterstein. This whole brings this whole brings up the question of intersubjectivity, with which I will conclude. Intersubjectivity is mistaken very often, again. People think that um, it refers to the interaction between two separate individuals or two separate um, sentient beings. Uh, but intersubjectivity is not the interaction, <laughs> is not the perception of the other, is not the communication with the other, is not making an agreement with the other. Intersubjectivity is the space common to two entities, to two human beings, the intermediate area or space between two people, in between. That's why it's intersubjective, between two subjects. You could reach an intersubjective agreement. You could, use, you could use this space to yield common ground, but it is the space, not the individuals, and not the interaction between the individuals. There are psychic elements which cannot develop exclusively in one's head without the participation of the other. According to Lacanian thought, all, all the unconscious is the internalization of the other. But even in more minimal versions, um, some things can be born, for example, language, only among individuals. Intersubjectivity refers to the subject's social constitution. Husserl, Merleau-Ponty and others um, wrote about this. Being in each other, interconnection, binding, which is initially concrete, sensorial, and only later is followed by ideas. And this, what makes us human, this intersubjective inter space. Whenever we meet another person, we create this common ground, this common ground, and we share it, and we tread upon it by mutual consent. This interaction, and then having established the common ground, we feel safe enough. The common ground is a secure base, we feel safe enough to introject the other person. And once the other person is introjected inside our minds, then we have an internal object, a representation of that other person. And then we continue with a dual interaction, externally and internally, except if we are narcissists. If we are narcissists, the interaction is completely internal and, in a way, solipsistic. I've done my best to elucidate these concepts for the benefit of self-styled experts, wannabe experts, future experts, and their dogs and mothers-in-law. And I hope I haven't bored you out of your minds. And I hope my introject has been quiescent throughout this lecture. And if not, just switch it off. What's the big deal? <laughs>